Awesome. Josh, thanks so much for the intro. Again, so my name is Mark Mossberg, and um, today I'm going to share with you a bit about reverse engineering uh, DAWs. And so this, uh, this talk is going to be a bit of a different flavor of audio programming. Um, we're not going to talk about stuff like real time or signals or even C++. But what we will be talking about is audio software. So DAWs, um, digital audio workstations, and their internals of how they work. We'll also touch on a bit of Python. Just a little bit about me before we start. So my background is actually in cybersecurity, and I worked as a security engineer um, in that field. I reversed uh, a lot of compiled binaries, file formats, and network protocols. Um, aside from all that, I'm also a music producer and DJ myself. I've been using DAWs for uh, a very long time, and I've used a bunch of them. And I just really like DAWs. Um, so this project kind of draws from both of these areas. Um, and just as a fun, fun fact, here's my vintage copy of uh, Live 7 that I have. So also a quick disclaimer before we start. Um, so I'm going to talk about a bit of kind of deep internals of stuff, but all of this work was done as a totally independent developer without any affiliation with Ableton or ImageLine. And I don't represent or speak for um, either of those companies. So now let's, let's dive into digital audio workstations or DAWs. So this is what they look like. Most of you are probably familiar. They are um, just the, these awesome pieces of software that are used by music producers and all kinds of audio content creators for doing almost anything that you would want with audio. They have a lot of functionality built into the DAW core, but of course, they're not going to be able to do absolutely everything. And so they're designed um, with this plug-in format, as we're, many of us are familiar with it familiar with, and that lets, um, that lets third parties have very defined interfaces and file formats for extending the DAW and adding uh, new features that are not built into the DAW core. The, the issue is that plugins really just interact with the audio subsystem of the DAW, and they can only really solve problems related to audio. So what I'm proposing is that DAW users actually have a wide variety of needs. And a subset of those are audio related. Um, so we have plugins, of course, that help us with those audio problems. But there's also another category that I call workflow problems. And plugins can't really address these because they're not really audio problems. Let me give you an example of what I mean by uh, workflow problems. So this is the main motivating example uh, for this entire project and what we'll dive deep into. I call this uh, time marker export. And so here's a feature of Live. Uh, you can add um, essentially annotations in the timeline with arbitrary text. And this is useful um, as a user for organizing your project. Um, FL Studio has the same kind of feature, just a very simple kind of annotation at an arbitrary time. For Certain niche use cases, it might be kind of nice to actually export these annotations from the DAW. Maybe you're a DJ um, and you want to give your listeners an awesome listening experience for your DJ mix. And so you want them to be able to ID the tracks. So you want a nice time stamped track list. Maybe you're a podcaster and you want to give your listeners a nice uh, map of your conversation with timestamps. And so these annotations are a very natural way to express this kind of information. And so it could be cool if you could export those into plain text or something. So some, uh, some DAWs let you do this, but Live and FL Studio don't. And so this represents an opportunity to extend the DAW with functionality that is not built in. So if we reach for our typical strategy for extending the DAW, we might think of adding a, a plugin for time marker export. But this is not going to work super well because, again, the plugins interact with the audio subsystem of the DAW. But those time markers are probably going to be in a different piece of the DAW. And there won't be an interface for accessing them. And so this is not going to work super well. So here's another approach. What if we actually approach this from the, the project file perspective? So DAWs need to serialize their entire state into a project file, which lets uh, users open up the project at an arbitrary time later in the, into the future. And part of that DAW state that they serialize is going to be the time markers. And so those are going to need to reside somewhere within the project file. 
such that uh, in the future, maybe a week or a month later, the user can open up that project and get the exact same state, including the time markers. So here's the idea. What if we could build our own third-party tool that could also load these projects, including those time markers? If we can do this, then our tool can do whatever we want, like export them to plain text or, or whatever. And so the real question is just how do we do this? How do we actually load a DAW project file? The, these files are um, proprietary and undocumented. And so we don't know the structure of what they look like inside. And so that's really where we get into reverse engineering. So here's my casual definition of reverse engineering. It's taking things apart to see how they work on the inside. And I think this is useful for three main uh, applications. If you understand how something works, you can fix it if it's broken or buggy. You can learn new things about it, like hidden or undocumented features. And you can extend it if it has lim limitations or doesn't do exactly what you want it to do. You can potentially push past those limitations yourself. I think that's the most interesting application. That's, that's what we'll focus on in this talk. And so the process of reverse engineering this file is just going to look like slowly examining pieces of the file until we get a, enough of a sense of it to accomplish our task. We don't need to uh, understand absolutely everything about the project, just enough to accomplish our goal, which is extracting the time markers. And so uh, before we dive deep into this, I just want to touch on a bit of prior art in the space of solving workflow problems. So there's the Live Enhancement Suite, which is by Dylan Tallchief and Inverted Silence. This is a very cool project that adds new features to Live through desktop automation, um, which is a very powerful approach. But for our use case, this is not going to allow us to extract the time markers. And so we need something different. There's another project. Um, at Bcrypt on Twitter has some scripts for Recordbox, including this very interesting script called Ableton to Qs.py, which allows conversion between live warp markers and Recordbox queues. And this is actually the same approach that we're going to use. It actually interacts with the project file. So both of these are tools for um, Ableton Live, though. I'm not aware of other tools uh, for DAWs like FL Studio. So we'll cover that today. So now let's actually dive deep into time marker extraction and how we're going to solve this. And so here's our goal. All we, all we want to do is just build a third-party tool that can analyze the DAW project file, extract those markers, and then we want to them as plain, output them as plain text. It's, it's pretty straightforward. And so here's, here's the map of how I want to explain this. I think of it in terms of three different modes of increasing difficulty um, I, that I call easy mode, hard mode, and unreal mode. So easy mode is for analyzing DAW projects that do not use tempo automation. So let's recap what tempo automation is. It's a DAW feature that allows the BPM of the project to be dynamically changed over time. So in this example, we're going from 105 BPM to 162 BPM. And so um, ideally, our tool would be very robust and would be able to handle all sorts of project files. And so we're going to need to handle this. But for easy mode, um, we're going to ignore this. That leads us to hard mode next. And that's where we're, go we're going to handle projects with tempo automation. Um, but we're going to do it in a bit of a naive way. And our results are going to actually be a bit inaccurate. And then lastly, we're going to do um, Unreal mode, which is where we're actually handling tempo automation. But we're going to use a more sophisticated um, implementation that actually achieves extremely high accuracy. And to do this, we're going to look into a bit of the DAW rendering, uh, rendering engine uh, details. There is technically a fourth mode uh, that I, I'll call super Unreal mode. Um, that's with handling nonlinear tempo automation, where we have actual curves in the automation. And um, so today, we're not going to cover that. We're just going to stick to linear tempo automation. So let's dive into easy mode, no tempo automation. So if you're like me at the start of this project, you're probably thinking that this is going to be really trivial. There's probably some kind of structure that is the marker structure, and it's going to have the text 
and the time of the marker and the, and the time is going to be in like milliseconds or something. And we just need to figure out where that is in the file, parse it out, print it out, and we'll be done. Um, and so that's, uh, that's actually not correct. And that's what starts to make this interesting. And so times are actually not stored in seconds or milliseconds. They're actually stored in terms of beat time. So let's talk about beat time. Um, beat time is another way of measuring time in the DAW that is related to how the DAW, um, the DAW's timeline. So the DAW has a timeline that's arranged as a grid uh, of measures, which are composed of beats. And so this is measuring um, musical time as opposed to kind of wall clock time. It's actually uh, very useful to store um, the times of objects in the timeline in beat time. And so examples of objects are going to be like MIDI clips and audio clips and, and time markers. If we store the object times in beat time, they're going to be resilient to tempo changes. So the tempo is going to govern how fast time elapses in the project. And so at um, higher tempos, it will elapse more quickly. And the opposite is true for lower tempos. And so if we have all our objects and then a user changes the tempo, we then need to recompute all the times if we're using um, wall clock time or real time. But with beat time, um, it's stable. If, if the user changes the tempo, the beat time still remains the same for the objects. And so that's why um, beat time is a very nice uh, kind of dimension to use for storing the times of objects in the timeline. Um, if you ever need to convert between um, beat time and real time, you can always do that using the BPM of the project, um, except for tempo automation, which we'll get to in a little bit. But it's just a very straightforward conversion. And so this brings us to kind of some pseudocode of how we can think about this problem. So first, we'll, we'll parse out the markers and the BPM, and we'll, we'll look about how to, uh, how to do that. But once we have the marker information and the BPM information, it's, it's pretty straightforward. We can just iterate through the markers and then we are we do our conversion from beat time to seconds time, and then we can just print them out with whatever formatting we'd like. Um, pretty straightforward. So, so here's kind of a, a shopping list of what we need from the project file for easy mode. We need to know how to get the markers out, their, their beat time, and their text. We also need to know how to get the project's tempo. So now let's actually dive into the project files and see how to how to get this. And so, um, so let's start with live. And so live uh, ALS files are actually just compressed XML, which, which immediately makes things a lot more easy. Um, this is because the, these files are actually human readable. And we can, we can uh, read through them and browse through them and, and reverse engineer that way. Um, but just because they're human readable doesn't mean they're documented, though. And so that there still is some difficulty there. Um, but as far as getting the information we need, it's very straightforward. There are some locators tags uh, that correspond to the markers. And uh, if you just look into those, we can get these, uh, these time and name elements. So the time is going to have the beat time, and the name has the text. And so um, that's really it. Moving on uh, to the tempo, it's also straightforward. There's a tempo tag, and we can just look at this uh, manual element and grab the tempo out of there. And so that's it for, for live. Uh, let's move on to FL Studio, where it gets a little bit more interesting. Um, so FL, FL Studio files, um, .flp, are, are not XML. They're actually um, a real um, binary format. Uh, it's raw, binary. It's unreadable, uh, unhuman readable. And it's, it's technically not documented, um, although there is this very interesting text file that seems to have been floating around the internet for 20 years. Um, that's from the creator, I believe, of, of FL Studio that actually explains uh, quite a bit of the format. So it's very helpful. Um, but it's, it's, of course, very old, so it, it's missing a lot of, of new parts of the format. Um, there's also some, some additional resources about parsing FLPs. And so th there's a few projects on GitHub. Um, a lot of them are very old, though, and they're missing a lot of the format. And so we'll still need to do a bunch of work to um, reverse engineer the, the parts we need. So let's actually talk about the structure now. Um, FLP files are, are organized into two sections. There's a header and a data section. So the header is a very straightforward file header with a, a file signature, and it lets you um, find basically the, the data section using the header length. 
And then the, the data section is really where it gets interesting. It's an array of so-called event structures. And here's how you uh, parse an FLP. You use the header to find the event block, and then you iterate over every event in the event block and interpret it. So each event is going to carry one specific piece of information about the project. And I little, what do we mean one like int or one string, stuff like that. And they each have a certain semantic meaning associated with them. And by iterating through and interpreting them all, you can construct the state of the project. So, and so here's how events work in detail. So all events start with a, a one byte ID. That's a unsigned 8-bit int from 0 to 255. Depending on where that int falls in that range, that will tell the parser how many bytes to read after that. And so you might read um, eight, um, an 8-bit eight, an eight int, a 16-bit int, a 32-bit int, or a variable length data, depending on where that ID falls within the range. So there's going to be up to 256 uh, separate events that are defined. And they, again, they contain information about all sorts of aspects about the project. Um, there are three specific events that we need. And this, uh, these were obtained through reverse engineering. These, these text names are just ones I gave it in my source code. I don't know the actual uh, names for it. But it's the marker time event, which is hex 94, which contains a 32-bit um, int, which has the, the marker beat, essentially. Um, the marker text, hex CD, which is a UTF-16 encoded string. And the tempo event, which is hex 9C, which is a 32-bit int in millibeats per minute. And so um, again, in addition to those, there are many, many other kinds of events uh, for the project, uh, for, for this file format. So that's actually it. That's actually it for easy mode. We have everything we need. We have the markers, the read times and text, and the tempo. We can implement our pseudocode algorithm um, just like that. So now let's move on uh, to hard mode, the next step. Uh, we're actually handling tempo automation. So just a reminder, here's what tempo automation looks like. And it's going to drastically change our approach because uh, we, we can no longer just do our nice, simple conversion from beat time um, to real time. Now, actually, with tempo automation, the time is going to be manipulated. And so uh, based on the automation segment, time is going to elapse at different speeds. Um, and so we'll need a totally different approach. And so now here, here's kind of an abstract algorithm we can use for going from a marker to its uh, real time. We need to start at the beginning of the timeline. And then we need to go through each automation segment and compute uh, the time elapsed during that segment. We'll do this for each segment until we reach the marker. And then we'll just sum up all of those previous segments. There are some edge cases here, but this is the, the main gist of the idea. And so let's dive deeper. So we can think of automation points as being these pretty simple structures with a beat time and a BPM value. And then we can implement our, our pseudocode for hard mode. So like before, we'll parse out the markers. Um, we'll also need to parse out the automation points now. Um, we don't need the global tempo anymore because we're, uh, it's kind of useless now that we have tempo automation. And then we'll do our simple iteration through the markers. and. And now, instead of that simple conversion, now we need to insert our, our compute seconds time, which is our more advanced uh, accumulation algorithm. But other than that, um, it's, it's, it's not too much more complicated than that. The really hard part is just that implementing that algorithm. Um, and so, so here's our shopping list for hard mode. So we already know how to get the markers, but we need some more information now. Um, we need to know how to get the automation points. And we also need to know what to do with them? How do we actually compute time elapsed during a tempo automation? And so let's take a, a nice, simple example uh, to start. And so let's say we have a, cur uh, a segment that goes from 60 BPM to 120 over four beats. Um, so this is actually just a physics one problem in disguise. This is the same thing as if someone asked you if an object accelerates from one meter per second to four over four seconds, how far does it travel? Um, the same kind of question. So to solve this, you would integrate over the domain. Um, and the units are all going to work out um, because the seconds cancel out when you multiply um, the two axes. And so you get meters. Um, 
it's 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 similar but not quite the same for BPM. And so we can't actually integrate the the BPM curve from 60 to 120 over four beats uh, directly. And this, this is because those units are actually not going to work out if we if we multiply beats per minute by by beats we get beats squared per minute, which doesn't uh, doesn't make sense. Um, so we actually need to take that beats per minute and and invert it into minutes per beat uh, time. And while we're at it, uh, we'll actually convert to seconds per beat. So we'll get a nice output in seconds if we do this. So once we have um, so once we have that seconds per beat, um, we'll go ahead and integrate it. So the general approach is going to be construct the BPM function for the curve, um, convert it to its seconds per beat form, and then integrate that seconds per beat function. So as an example. Um, since we're only doing linear lines, it's very straightforward to construct the BPM function for a segment. And that's 15x plus 6, 60 uh, for this uh, segment. We'll then convert it to seconds per beat by inverting it um, beneath uh, 60. And that will give us um, the seconds per beat function, which is 4 over x plus 4, which is actually a, a nonlinear function. And then we can integrate this. Um, and we can use um, scipy to do this very very easily from our code. And we'll get a final result of 2.77 seconds um, elapses during this tempo automation. And so that's, that's, um, that's how to compute elapsed time during a linear tempo automation. So the last point we need is, um, is the automation points. So let's look into the files again. So say we have a, a live set with two automation points. Um, this is what it looks like. And so we go into the XML again. Um, we'll go back to that tempo tag from before. But this time, we'll look for something called the automation target ID. We'll save that for later. Then we'll go to this master track XML um, element and go inside and look for its on automation envelopes. We'll keep going into the XML tree. And we'll look for the particular automation envelope that has this pointy ID value that matches the automation target of the tempo. This is how um, the various uh, automations in the master track get kind of routed to different parameters. So once we find the envelope for the tempo, we can just look into its um, events. And they're called uh, float events. And our data is right there. We have this time, which is the beat time, and the value, which is the BPM, just what we needed. Um, now let's look at FL Studio, where things are are way harder. Um, they're harder because FL Studio is more advanced in how it can um, do its automations. Um, it supports this idea of an automation curve that actually has multiple instances on the timeline that all point back to this single core storage for the automation curve. And so um, here's an example of, of this where we have a bunch of these core storage uh, curves on the left, and they have multiple instances on the timeline on the right. And so those that core storage uh, is called channels. And those instances on the timeline will be called playlist items or quips. Um, and so here's how we need to approach getting the automation for this. Um, so here and, and so here are those um, kind of abstract structures. And so a channel can be thought of as having an ID. It has a destination and parameter ID to kind of route it to a, a certain parameter and then an array of automation points. It's the core storage for those points. Then we have the playlist item, which has a channel ID to point back to the channel, and then a start beat and a length that describes its position in the timeline. And so here's how we're going to do this. So our first step is we're going to parse out all of the channels and all playlist items, um, even the ones that aren't relevant to tempo automation, because there's other kinds of automations. Um, and so we'll use a bunch of events for this. We'll use the channel new, hex 40, automation channel, hex uh, E3, automation data, hex EA, and playlist items, uh, hex E9, to parse all of this information. Um, next, we'll, we'll filter out um, the automation channels we don't want. And so um, we'll do this using the master track ID, which is hex 4000, and the tempo parameter, which is hex 5. And again, all these, all these hex numbers um, came about as part of the reverse engineering process and looking into these um, files. Once we filter out those channels, we can filter out all the playlist items that don't matter um, using the channel IDs of the automation channels. The next step is to render the playlist items points. And so what this means is we need to take 
those, those points in the core storage and actually resolve them into the global timeline space. This is because those, those points in the core storage, um, their positions are not stored as, uh, as beat times, they're stored as offsets from the start of the clip because that one um, core storage needs to be kind of re relocated to multiple places in the timeline. So here, here's an example. Say we have a channel with, uh, with three points. Um, they might be at plus two, plus 10, and plus 14 from the start of the clip. Um, and we have two um, playlist items that start at 10 and 60. We need to resolve those points um, offsets against the start times of each of those clips. And this takes those, um, those three um, kind of abstract points and renders them into the actual six points that exist in the timeline. So we'll do this for every single channel. And then the last step is we need to merge them all into one coherent um, automation stream for, for the whole timeline. And so, um, so it's, that's, that's the last step. It's, it's, all, it's way harder than, than with live, but that's all we need to do uh, to get those automation points um, for FL Studio. So next. Um, so now, now we have everything we need for hard mode, actually. So our, our shopping list is kind of done. Um, but, but there's one problem, actually. So if we go back to our original um, example curve, uh, 60 to 120, um, we, we calculated it should take 2.77 seconds. And if we actually look at what live says, if we measure this in live, um, it actually doesn't match. It Live says it takes 2.836 seconds. Um, and so this is this is kind of, uh, this is not great. Um, this is actually not because our, our math is wrong. Um, it's actually kind of because our math is a bit too right. Um, but there's some important lessons actually in this. And so the first one is that accuracy is going to be relevant for us. Uh, this project is not just simply extracting static data from the file and printing it out. We're actually doing a lot of recomputation and math. And so based on our implementation, we might actually have higher or, or lower accuracy. The, the second lesson is that accuracy is defined by the DAW. So no matter how perfect and theoretical our, our math is, um, what matters at the end of the day is that our results match exactly what the DAW reports. And if, and if we're not right, um, and if it doesn't match, um, that's, that's our fault. We need to do something to, to make it match. And so that's uh, leading us to Unreal mode, where we're actually going to, to solve this problem and understand why there was that error and how we can uh, address it. And so with Unreal mode, we're going to finally stop talking about physics and math and actually talk a little bit about audio. Because um, up, until, up until this point, we've kind of ignored um, the, the real practicalities of, of audio rendering. Um, so I'm, I'm really not an expert in audio rendering, and this might be incorrect, but my impression is that DAWs cannot truly render audio that's at an actual changing tempo. They actually need to approximate it, and they do this by effectively sampling the automation curve um, every so often, and then stitching together these, uh, these blocks of audio that have been rendered at a static tempo. And so, our automation curve is actually going to look more um, like this uh, stair, like the step function, than that linear automation. And so this is going to require a totally new approach for calculating the time elapsed during an automation. So here's how we're going to do it. The first step is we're going to find the BPMs at those step points. Next we'll convert those BPMs to their SPB form, those points along the SPB function. We'll then construct the SPB stepwise function and then integrate this. So this is actually going to be the time elapses uh, during the automation adjusted for how the DAW works. But in order, and, and so all that math is, is actually very straightforward. It's just, it's just some you know, algebra and arithmetic. But in order to implement it, there's this one key parameter that we're missing, and that's the tempo quantization, which is basically how often is the DAW sampling the automation curve? This is a implementation detail of the DAW. It is not documented as far as I've seen, and it is not stored in the project file as far as I know. And so this is another 
uh, opportunity for us to do some reverse engineering. And so for Unreal Mode, we are really almost there. We just need, we have the markers, we have the automation points. We know how to apply our new strategy for computing the time adjusted for how the DAW works. But we, we need this one last, um, last item, which is the quantization value. So how do we find that for, for Live in FL Studio? And my, my first approach for doing this was to, uh, to give up and ask for help because I, at this point, I was actually totally confused. I, I did not know anything about this, uh, this rendering stuff or quantization. I just knew my math was wrong for some reason. Um, so I actually asked the Ableton support for help. I filed a, a very weird bug with Ableton about this. Um, and they very kindly responded to me and actually told me that uh, live changes tempo every, every 16th beat or every 16th note. So. Uh, that's really it. That's that's exactly what we needed. That's the tempo quantization, which we can use in our algorithm. Um, so I still needed to do this for FL Studio. I didn't want to go and ask the FL Studio support for help also. Um, so I actually came up with a, a, a way to identify the FL Studio quantization without having to ask. And that's through a technique um, I call brute forcing. And so we're going to brute force the quantization value. And here's what we're going to do. And so um, so here's what we know about this situation. So we know that the DAW is doing quantization, or we can reasonably assume this. We know that it was likely going to be on a power of two, like 16th notes, 32nd notes, uh, 64th notes, et cetera. And most importantly, we know that there's not actually that many choices for what it can be. The DAW is in practice probably not going to do something like 2 to the 14th note uh, quantization. And so um, there's not that many options. And so what if we just kind of try them all is the idea here. So here's how we're going to do this. Uh, we'll pick a known automation curve, like our friendly 60 to 120 over 4 beats curve. We'll put that into um, the DAW. And we'll measure what it actually reports. And so interestingly, it actually does report uh, 2.77 seconds in FL Studio. Um, but then we'll go and we'll create a test harness. And this is a standalone calculation of that um, time, uh, kind of time elapsed calculation, but it's going to be parameterized on the quantization. And so it'll, it'll accept that as an argument. Um, don't try to, don't worry about reading this code. It's just some NumPy that does exactly those four steps we were looking at earlier. But the key part is that it takes uh, some parameters, and that's going to be the start and end BPM of the segment, the interval um, of the segment in, in beats, and a quantization to try. And we'll, what we'll do, or, and, and so um, this function uh, outputs the time elapsed given, given the DAW calculation, and it's going to be the, you know, our, our version of what the DAW says um, in our kind of standalone calculation. And so the last thing is we're just going to try a bunch of different values. So here I'm trying the first 13 powers of 2, um, plugging that into the function and seeing what it prints out. And what's interesting is that so for 16, we can actually see a uh, lives quantization. It, for 16th notes, we see 2.836, which is what, uh, which is what live said. So we can kind of externally confirm uh, lives uh, quantization, even if, if in case they were like lying to us or something. Um, it's nice to have some external confirmation of this. Um, if we go look down, we can see some values that could potentially be FL Studio's uh, value. We have, see a number that uh, a number of quantizations that round to 2.77. So in practice, I I've been using 512, and it seems to work pretty well. And so. So we've, we found the, the quantization. I actually wanted to show you, to show you this one uh, kind of creative, neat thing where we can actually, in addition to brute forcing, we can actually observe the quantization uh, with our senses using the DAW. And so I have this video to show here. And I'm just going to play it, but then quickly pause. So here I have uh, live open, and I have a bunch of hi-hat samples into the timeline. The BPM is super short. And the color transitions are on 16th notes. So all those notes within one color are within a 16th note boundary. Towards the bottom of 
live, I have some tempo automations. And towards the last two, they ramp up really sharply, going from 20 to 1,000 BPM. And so in practice, if we were to play this, we would expect to hear some kind of ramping up in the, the frequency of how fast the hi-hats are playing because the tempo is ramping up. But I'll, I'll just play the clip. So sorry if that sound is a bit harsh, but what you'll notice is that it was completely constant. The hats play at a totally constant rate, which means that they're not affected by these ramp ups in, in the tempo automation. And that's because, as we know, um, it, live is, is basically sampling that curve every 16th note, so at the start of every color transition, and throwing away the rest of the curve. And this is an inter interesting like audio way to kind of confirm this with our senses. So we can move on. So now that's actually it. We've kind of reached the end um, of Unreal mode. We can now do everything. We have the markers, we have the automation points, we have a time elapsed, and we know how to get the quantization value. So we can, now we can finally implement our, our awesome, sophisticated, advanced um, time recovery algorithm to extract these markers. And so this is, this is just a visual way of describing a kind of the, the system we've built. So now we can uh, build our third party tool. We know everything we need to know to process both live and FL Studio files, grab those markers and tempo automations, and then use them to export our plain text um, track list of the times and the markers. And so it's, it's robust, meaning it supports all sorts of project files, those with and without tempo automation. And also it's especially high accuracy because we use those DAW rendering details to go the next step further. And if we go back to our original goal, um, we, we've really done it. We, we have the third-party tool. It an analyzes the files, extracts them, and outputs them as plain text. And so, um, so we've, we've really done it. So um, now I'll talk a bit about my actual implementation. And so I've implemented this all in a tool called DAW tool. It's written in Python 3. It has all the parsers for the DAW formats, um, including a bunch of different versions of, of Live and FL Studio. Um, it implements this time marker extraction algorithm, and it has modes for operating in both uh, theoretical and uh, DAW accurate modes. Um, it also does not have any dependencies with the slight caveat that, that I do use SciPy for the um, integration stuff for theoretical mode, but that mode is disabled by default. And in practice, you would not want to use it because it's, it's inaccurate. And so in practice, for the real dot accurate mode, there are, are no dependencies since it's all written from scratch. So here's just a casual evaluation of its performance. Um, for I, 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 to do this, I used different project files of increasing numbers of automation points, which is really what's going to affect uh, the performance of the algorithm. And we can see that for projects ranging from 10 to 1,000 automation points, it can all process them in uh, on the order of 200 milliseconds. We can add many, many more automation points if we want to really get crazy with it. So with uh, 10,000 automation points and 100,000 automation points, then we start to see some exponential behavior. It takes about five seconds to process um, this file with 100,000 points. But to be honest, the, the DAWs don't work well at that point anyway. And so that's not, no one, no one would really do that. And so it's just, a, it's, a, it's like a stress test. Um, so now about the accuracy. And so, so in general, the results are extremely accurate for most of those normal use cases. Um, you know, it's going to be down down to the millisecond or down to the um, centisecond for, for FL Studio because it doesn't show as much ac um, precision on the, on the numbers. But in general, it's totally accurate. But under some stress tests, it is possible to actually observe a bit of error. And so for live under stress tests, I've observed about a millisecond of error accumulate. Um, so here are some pictures. So here's actually that live file with 100,000 automation points. This is, this is what it looks like. Um, there's some interesting visual glitches. Um, and for m measuring the marker at the very end, um, after any error would have accumulated a lot over time, if there was any error in that time calculation, we get um, this, this number that ends in 0.806 uh, milliseconds. And if we run a uh, DAW tool on this file, we actually get exactly the same number down to the millisecond, which is really encouraging. What's 
What's actually kind of uh, mysterious that I don't totally understand is that for this file with only 10,000 automation points, um, it is actually possible to observe that millisecond error I'm talking about. And so I think I was just getting lucky in that previous one where the error accumulates in such a way that it doesn't get rounded or something. Um, but I just want to point out that this is one millisecond of drift over a 16-hour live set. So I'm, I'm really not too worried about it. Um, for FL Studio, um, there is a lot more error. It's about about half a second of error can potentially accumulate during a stress test. And I'm, I'm kind of blaming this on all the complexity and parsing those automation points, because it's it's really tricky, and there are a lot of edge cases. Um, so here is an FL Studio project with 100,000 automation points. It's this nice <laughs> big block. <laughs> and um, we can measure the time in FL and the tool, and we can actually see that there is a bit of error, about half a second of error. But again, this is under a stress test. No one would actually use this. The DAWs don't work. When, if you're doing this, uh, this is just more for fun. Um, the point is that it, I would say this, this is very high accuracy, um, more than enough accuracy for most practical use cases. I don't think a lot of DJs are going to care that the, the results are, are milliseconds off. So now I can, I can just jump in and do a quick demo of this. Um, I'll just open up live in FL Studio and then flip my screen share over to that. Opening up now. OK, great. So now I'm going to share. Oops. So now I'm going to share the whole screen. OK, so we'll start over with, um, with live. Hopefully you can see this. Um, so we'll start with live. So here is a kind of like a studio DJ mix I made in live entirely. I have tempo automation because I warped every track for super smooth transitions. And um, I have my time markers or, or locators at every transition. And it's it's really fast and intuitive to do this because it's, it's just so visual to place these markers at the right places. So we can go ahead and measure the um, this final marker. And if you look at where my mouse is towards the bottom left, Live is reporting uh, this 2716.449 number. I'll ho hop over to my terminal where I have dot tool uh, running. And I'll just run it here. And we'll see that this last uh, marker, it says 2716.449. And so it down to the millisecond, it, it was accurate. We can use the verbose um, flag to actually get some debugging information, which is interesting to look at. And so here it's dumping the entire timeline that it parsed out, uh, including all those markers. You can see the marker objects in there and their, their times um, and their texts. And we can also see um, all the automation points that are parsed out. And we can also see uh, the, the results of those incremental time calculations. So it does this for the whole timeline, dumps the timeline. Um, you can also do this with the, the theoretical mode. And so we'll actually see that if we do this with theoretical mode, um, it's off a little bit. You know, it's 449 was the precise uh, results. But here we're getting 421. So we're seeing that inaccuracy um, come into play. So now I'll just quickly jump over to FL Studio. We'll show the same thing. Um, so here is, uh, I actually don't really know how to use I felt that well, so I didn't make a DJ mix in it. But um, here is a kind of representative um, set uh, or set of automation points in it. And we have this um, ADC marker all the way at the end. And we measure its position um, as precisely as we can. We're seeing this 2427.90 uh, uh, number. And so we can run dot tool on this FLP uh, normal. Um, and we have only one marker, so it just prints out, um, yeah, 2427.90, um, one. It's an extra precision there. And so, yeah, it's getting it down to the uh, centisecond. Um, so that's just, and it, we can also just, we can, you know, we can move the marker a little bit down, save the file. Uh, oops. Oh, no. Thanks. Um, 
I don't know how to get rid of that because I don't know how to actually know how to use FL Studio that well, but I'll switch back over to, to live um, and we'll just move this marker over here. Um, so again, we'll, we'll move this thing you know, a, a bit over. We'll save the file. We'll remeasure it. Now it's saying uh, .938 um, as the time. We'll go back to this command line um, saying .938 is what we see for the last marker. And so, it, so it's actually working. Um, we're computing the time very accurately. So now I'll just hop back over to the slides. Um, OK, great. So I'll just wrap up now. Um, basically, yeah, so what, what have we been seeing? The idea is that DAW users have all sorts of different needs. Um, they have audio needs, and those are solved very well with plugins. But they might also have workflow problems that plugins cannot address. So that's why we can reach for techniques like project file manipulation, um, like we saw today with DawTool, or um, for desktop automation like the Live Enhancement Suite uses um, to solve these workflow problems. And specifically, this time marker exporter we built today is just one example of this general class of techniques that I call project file manipulation. But my question for you is, is what other uh, tools can we build using this approach? Um, is there anything else that's interesting or cool that we can do with it? Um, so if, just some broader context, I've been running this tool as a hosted uh, free web app that anyone can use. And I've been running it since about March of this year. And what's actually kind of interesting is that people actually use it. Um, we hit 700 uploads uh, recently, which is pretty neat. A, a few people generally use it every day, which I think is, is cool because this is just such a niche use case. But there are still really people out there that benefit from it. So I think this, this actually shows that there is this really interesting position in the ecosystem for these kinds of tools. I really think that it makes sense to have these third-party tools that implement possibly niche features that maybe, maybe Ableton doesn't want to develop and maintain and support this random feature that 100 people are going to use. But that doesn't mean those people need to go with their problem unsolved. So I really think this is, this is a win for everybody because um, the DAW developers don't need to maintain random code. The third-party people can have fun building whatever awesome tools they want. And the users can have their, their problems uh, solved, um, even if it's not worth the DAW developer's time. Um, here are just some screenshots from track lists I've seen out in the wild of people using timestamps, um, people doing DJ mixes. Um, this person was selling beats on SoundCloud and put all their beats in one track. And so they timestamped those to let people know, you know how to reference the beats and specify their collabs. Um, some more DJ mixes, DJ mixes. Um, so that's mostly it. I just want to leave you with this, with this one um, kind of point, and that's you are more powerful than you think. If, you're, if the software you use has limitations, um, those are not necessarily set in stone. If the software you use is broken or buggy or doesn't exactly do what you want, it might be possible for you to just on your own figure out how to bypass those limitations and solve your problem without having to wait for the developers. So you are more powerful than you think. I want to say thank you to my friend Luke for um, help with Unreal Mode, uh, to Ableton and ImageLine for their amazing products, for everyone that's used timestamps, and to all the organizers um, of ADC20. And I want to thank you so much for tuning in. My name is Mark Mossberg. I'm everywhere on the internet at Offline Mark. Um, I have a bunch of bonus content that didn't fit into this talk that I'll be posting on my Twitter later. Um, you can find DawTool on GitHub right after this when I um, release it. And um, you can find timestamps at timestamps.me. So again, thank you so much. <laughs>